Thanks everybody for coming to lecture number three, year number three of the classes being put on by the University of Victoria Student Society Hembology 101 Club and uh, the uh, International Hembology 101 Society. And uh, a couple of logistics before I get into today's class. Next week's class, I'm quite excited about. We again have Bill Finley, the owner of Hempton Company, and Shift coming to talk about the various products that are available, uh, hemp based products uh, on the marketplace, a bit about how they're produced and why uh, we should be trying to use hemp in most of our daily needs. And so uh, that's going to be really exciting to, to have and uh, we're, we're looking forward to that. I should also note that a couple of weeks after that, I think uh, Dr. Paul Hornby is coming for his cannabis chemistry lecture. We hope to expand that. Um, we might not get away with a full hour, but we should be able to have a 45 minute lecture that day and uh, hope to try as much information on the doctor of one of these heads as possible while he's here. So uh, that's coming up, uh, I don't have the exact date, I think October 13th, but I could be wrong. I'm wrong about many things. So uh, that aside, I guess, uh, thanks everybody for coming. Uh, just a, a reminder, I think everyone has signed up, but for those who sign up and come to every lecture through a semester, we give certificates of completion. Uh, to you for coming, and that includes those friends that show up online. So welcome uh, again, everybody, and uh, thanks for sticking it out uh, online. Um, these classes, as you may know, are available on YouTube for people to watch later, but you kind of have to be here to get this certificate. It's the way we like to work it. So today's lecture is on cannabis around the world, which is not necessarily easy for me because I'm born and raised Canadian. I haven't been around the world uh, a lot, and so um, my knowledge is, is prominently based on this country and what I've studied or seen or, or heard from friends, but uh, I'll do my best. So I thought to start with, in some ways, the most obvious um, international player in the cannabis field, you may say, which would be the United States likely, I, I think without a doubt, the largest consumer of cannabis, um, not necessarily on a per capita basis, but in terms of just the sheer amounts of, of cannabis. In fact, probably most illicit drugs, um, the United States would be the number one consumer around the world. Um, and so it's an interesting market to look at, not only because uh, of its kind of unique size, given that, that it's prohibited as well to such a, a stark degree, um, but also because of how much is actually imported into the United States from other countries. So some countries rely quite heavily, uh, maybe not uh, officially, but, but unofficially on their ability to uh, supply uh, cannabis and, and cannabis hashish or, or cannabis hash oil uh, to the United States. But uh, just, but that doesn't mean that, that there isn't a lot coming from within the United States. And you know, the numbers game is, is one of the favorite things for, for everyone to throw around, whether you're a, a, a government official or, or an a activist, because there's no way you can prove anybody's numbers. So I, I may pick and choose some numbers out of a hat here, but you know, it's a guessing game as to how large these industries are, I, I would have to say. But, uh, some estimate as much as 40%, 60% even, of the cannabis and hash used in the United States is actually produced in that country. Um, it seems as though only a small percentage of the cannabis used in the United States actually comes from Canada, much less even British Columbia. Mexico is by, by far the largest exporter into the United States. But as I said, a, a huge amount of the cannabis economy um, in, in the billions of dollars. I think I have some some quotes, don't I, in the back of this? Or maybe they're in my book. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the, uh, the, the number of people, yeah, damn it, I don't have them here, um, employed 
in the United States and in the cannabis industry is in the, the hundreds of thousands to be sure. Um, again, it's, it's hard to say how much, but there are certain areas where there's a large amount of domestic production in the United States. Uh, as you can see here on the map, this is from the, uh, I think the DEA webpage. And again, for those people online, uh, I think with the exception of one this time, all of the pictures are available up on the web page, so you can refer to these uh, later on or as the class is going on. They're on hempology.ca in the photo gallery. And so you can see here a large amount of production is sort of the, uh, the West, California, the, the Pacific Northwest. But, but not all, interestingly enough, there's a, a huge area from the Appalachia here, but I think that's you know the Kentucky kind of Arkansas backdrop, you might say, and uh, people are often surprised to find how much cannabis is being grown there, and it might not make sense to some people, um, but when you study the history of the cannabis culture and how it's evolved and, and progressed, in a lot of ways it does make a lot of sense where the cannabis is being grown in, in that part of the United States because one of the uh, causes of the revival was the Vietnam War when many uh, young poor uh, US citizens were sent to to fight that war and there's some famous footage of uh, soldiers uh, smoking what they would call a shotgun literally smoking uh, joints uh, through a, a, a gun and, and blowing it um, there's one famous footage I forget where it exactly came from but where uh, sort of a, a, a sergeant had his team and he was going around giving them all hits off of this shotgun. Um, and uh, in many ways, uh, they're, they're both with opiates, certainly, unfortunately, but also with cannabis, um, a lot of uh, um, poor white youth were introduced to the cannabis culture for the first time. Certainly, alcohol is, was huge. You know, everybody knows about all the you know bootlegging that went on in the hills of Kentucky. Um, but uh, um, the song "Copperhead Road" that uh, um, that you may have heard of by Steve Earle, um, it really symbolizes what happened here because when uh, a lot of these uh, you know uh, guys came back from from war in Vietnam. Um, they didn't have job skills. They went into the army as soon as they came out of high school. And uh, at the same time, to deal with uh, different um, you know, stress-related issues from war, let alone physical pains that they may have, or just the stress of life, you know, many of them turned to using cannabis. And so there's always been a, a very large contingency within the uh, um, uh, military even uh, of cannabis users within the United States since that time period. And so many of them, like the Copperhead Road says, brought the seeds back uh, with them. Or they brought them from Mexico um, or you know other parts of the world. Um, the Northwest here, uh, there's many reasons why uh, that's uh, um, the, the main uh, cultivating area, partly because there's just so much space partly because of the sort of freedom that comes, uh, at least in theory, of living in the West and the, the tolerance, it seems, there is for, for alternative lifestyles out here that doesn't seem to exist in, in the East as much. And uh, again, uh, you know, in California in particular, there was a, a large influx of, of uh, um, soldiers come back. And uh, also in, in California, um, many Mexicans have, have moved up. Uh, and, uh, um, as uh, you, know, you can see with Cheech and Chong, there's always been you know, this uh, very uh, close relationship with, with Mexicans and, and, and California and the, the cannabis culture. It's, it's uh, an, an ongoing thing that I'll, I'll come back to shortly. Yeah. That just kind of gives you an idea of where, where things are at in the United States and, and how it ties in a little bit with uh, uh, some, some international <laughs> ideas. So um, a lot of the cannabis grown in the United States is grown indoors.